That song that we just sang has a lot to do with the message from Acts chapter 27 today. And uh, so your singing is part of what God is saying, I think, to us. You may be seated, but I'm going to pray for Pastor Daniel and his wife, Sadie. Uh, they've been gone now for a couple of weeks, and uh, we look forward for them coming back. They're on sabbatical, and they ask for us to pray for them, that God would just renew and strengthen and bless their uh, relationship with God. They're going to come back excited about what God is going to do. And so we're excited about what he's saying. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity for Pastor Daniel and Sadie to be away. We pray, Lord God, that your word would just speak to them, encourage them, strengthen them, bless them. Give new vision, Lord God, that when they come back, we're going to be so excited about the things that you're sharing, the direction that you have for us to go. Lord God, it's amazing that when we trust in you, that you go before us, you follow after us, you say, this is the way, walk ye in it. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 27 today, going through the book. We're almost to the end of the book. Amazing how quick things go. And yet, I uh, trust that we've been excited about the different things that God has been saying to us. Uh, how many have read through the book of Acts at least three times since we started this? Yeah, that's what I thought. You're waiting till Sunday. You say, ah, oh, they'll tell us all about it. We don't have to read it. No, read the Word of God. Let God speak to you. He has uh, amazing things that he wants to say to you. And so if you haven't read through the book of Acts, you've only got a couple more weeks, okay? Read it through at least once, okay? Just on your own, ask God to show you what he wants to say to you. Well, we're talking about his last journey uh, Paul has made several journeys, three missionary journeys, and this is the last journey that he's on. And what I'd like to focus on today, uh, as we go through this chapter, we do think about decisions that are being made. Sometimes we make our own decisions, and sometimes decisions are made for us. When I was little, almost every decision had to be made for me. And uh, I was looking forward to getting older, and uh, getting to a place where I could make my own decisions. Anybody ever look forward to that type of thing? I can make my own decisions. When I got to that place, I wasn't excited about making my own decisions. <laughs> but sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we need to make decisions. And this chapter is all about decision making. And so we're going to read together and we're going to go through this. If you have your Bibles, Bibles open them, uh, turn to them, and we'll follow through. Acts chapter 27 and verse 1 says, When it was decided, somebody decided for Paul, that we would sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustinian cohort named Julius. So here's somebody in charge of him, and they were putting the other prisoners with him on board. And embarking in an adramatic ad uh, ship, which is about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to the, uh, to the sea accompanied by Aristarchus, the Macedonian from Thessalonica. Uh, <clears throat> here we have already three people that uh, we've run into. We have Paul the Apostle, of course, Julius we've just met, but uh, there's two other people there. One is a disciple of Paul, Aristarchus, and we've seen him before, and now he's coming on this journey. And I read a commentary that said, he probably had to become a slave of Paul to be able to get on ship. So he had to actually become a slave to the Apostle Paul, then he could go on with everybody else. I don't know if that's altogether true, but then we find one other person, and that is the person that wrote the book of, of Acts. And who is that? Thank you. Somebody said Luke. It's, it's Luke, and we have the we sections here. And so when you see we, it's Luke writing this, and that's who's behind the we. It says in verse number three, the next day we put out in, at, at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with some considerable and allowed him consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. Remember, Paul was locked up for two years before he was allowed to then say, I appeal to Caesar, and now he's on his way to Rome, and so... His condition may be uh, not so healthy. He'd been in jail, chains, and all of that kind of thing. And Julius seems to be a very kind man because when they got to Sidon, he said, you have some friends here? Yeah. He sent him off of the ship 
I don't know if he sent a soldier with him to make sure that he was guarded, wouldn't run away, I don't know. But he needed care, and his friends could give him care. You could just see something's happening here in Apostle Paul's life, and he's being cared for even on his way to Rome to be tried there. And so he got this care. Verse 4 says, From there he put out to the sea, sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the winds were contrary. Now, they're entering into a time when you just don't go out in any boats out on the Mediterranean because it's a dangerous time of the year. So the winds were contrary. Verse 5 says, When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra of of Lycia and in Lycia. So here they're coming to this place and uh, they're finding that they need to stop. And when they stopped there, it was important for them to stop because it says there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and he put us aboard it. And so there's been a change even of ships. I think the first ship was more conducive to comfort. The second ship that they got on was from Egypt, and it was a grain ship. It held wheat. Uh, There's a picture I have here of the directions that they were going, and you see them stopping there in Saida, going on over to Mira. There they changed ships and went on a grain ship. As they start their journey toward uh, Italy, they had to go south and go around Crete. That wasn't the original plan, but because the winds were contrary, because they were already entering into a dangerous time and a season of the year, they couldn't continue their direction. So they go down to Crete and they find themselves in Fair Haven. That sounds like a good place to go to me. Fair Haven sounds like a good place. That sound okay to you? Anyway, that's where they were at. And so uh, in verse 7 it says, And we had sailed slowly for a good many days with difficulty and had arrived off Sindus, uh, since the wind did not permit us to go further. We sailed under the shelter of Crete off Solomon. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Haven, near which was the city of Lycia. And so here's where they're, they're at. And I don't know about you, but when I go someplace, I want to plan when I leave and when I get there. Back in these days, you had to plan a long time. They're going out in dangerous waters, and they're going out in ships that weren't that sailable sometimes, (laughs) especially during dangerous winds and times. And so here they are sailing through uh, on this grain ship. And by the way, there are 276 people on board. Now, this ship, and I looked up to see if I could find the best description, and I found a couple different different descriptions of the ship that they were now on, this grain ship. It went from that wall all the way to that wall. It was quite a big ship for that time, and it was 45 feet wide, which means it probably from this wall here to the back row there. 276 people were on that vessel. Most of the vessel was filled with wheat. They didn't have sweet rooms. They weren't that comfortable. Most of the time, people were on the deck. They didn't have beds. They didn't have these nice lounge chairs. They didn't have a swimming pool there. It wasn't any of that. It was a grain ship from Egypt. And they were on, on the way to Italy. And so this seemed appropriate uh, to get on board here and to take off and to maybe we can get there. But when are we going to get there? They decided that winter's here and Paul has an idea. Maybe we ought to stay in Fairhaven. Let's go on and read here. Verse number nine. When considerable time, considerable time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous since even the fast was already over, the the fast that they had just gone through, September, October, somewhere, concerning the Day of Atonement. There was a fast day. Jewish people would understand that. That was just finished. And now they're entering into a ship that isn't going to sail all the way, and so they're gonna have to fast during this ship as well. (laughs) They're not planning on it, but that's what happened. We'll get there. It says, and Paul then said to them, Begin to admonish them. Men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also 
our own lives. Paul said, I don't want to prophesy a bad word here, but it's dangerous out there. And if we keep sailing, we might end up in a bad situation. The ship could be lost. We could even get lost, and our lives would be in danger. Many ships that traveled that area, when the winds came from the north and, and drove themselves, would go down all the way to Africa, and they'd land on the beaches, on the rocks there by the beaches, and they were destroyed. Many people lost their lives. It wasn't an unusual thing. So Paul is prophesying here, and he's saying, this is what I think we ought to do. Let's stay here. Let's not go any further. Have you ever had a caution like that come to you? Hmm, many heads are shaking. Yeah, we, sometimes we are planning something, and somehow we just don't feel comfortable with that. We think, ah, maybe I ought to do something different. That's the goodness of God to us. If you love Jesus, if you know Jesus, then he protects us like that. He shows us things. He, he does things in our life that, that calms us and takes us maybe even sometimes a different direction. Down in verse number 11, however, after Paul gave his prophecy, he says, but the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. So he listened to the pilot, listened to the captain, and they said, we think we can make it. All they wanted to do was go 50 miles to the end of Crete. And there, there was a place for them, and uh, it was a better place than Fairhaven, evidently. And the pilot and the captain said, no, let's continue on. It'll be a good thing. Paul had already warned them that it wouldn't be. Verse 12 says, because the harbor was not suitable for wintering. Fairhaven sounds like a nice place to me. Sounds like you ought to be able to hang out there for a while. <laughs> but they wanted to keep on going because they thought the other harbor would be better for them. The majority reached a decision. You always have to be careful when a majority reaches a decision. We live in America where we're looking for majorities in every event that people are allowed to vote. But let me tell you, the majority isn't always right. Remember when the spies were sent in to search out the land, come back with a report? 10 out of 12 said, oh, we can't go in there. It's impossible. The giants live in that land. And they gave such a bad report that they wandered through the wilderness for another 40 years. Majorities are not always correct, okay? Sometimes it's only an individual in the midst that has the word of the Lord. And we need to have ears to hear uh, and hearts to receive what God is saying to us. Anyway, the majority reached the decision to put out to the sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, that's where they wanted to go, a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. So they wanted to go 50 more miles to what they said was a better harbor. We'll spend the winter there. You know winter is at least three months long, right? We haven't even entered into winter yet here. You know that, right? <laughs> I remember when the snowstorm came a few years ago in November while the leaves were still on the trees and it made havoc of everything. Well, no snow yet. I don't know if it's going to snow this winter. Uh, maybe climate warming is a real thing. And if it is, I like it. You know, it's pretty <laughs> nice. Uh, no problem. I mean, if you think about climate warming, when you look at the end of time and what's going to happen, there's going to be a lot of warm stuff happening, <laughs> right? Very warm stuff, and we want to be delivered from that. We want to go into a cool place, which I'm sure heaven is like. Anyway, <laughs> verse number 13. When a moderate south wind came up, supposing, again, not realistically, but they made a decision on this, that they had attained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along creek close to inshore. Now that says something. The south wind is coming, said okay now things are favorable, we can head out of Fairly and we can go these 50 miles and get to the place where we want to go. It seemed perfect. When you think things are going well, sometimes they don't always go well, do they? And so from this place on we have a different happening in what's going on in the ship. You look in verse 14, it says, but for very long, there rushed down from the land a violent wind. 
called a nor'easter. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves be driven along. Ever been in a, in a boat where now you're not in control any longer? My wife does not want to go on a cruise ship. Our church in New Jersey decided they would send us on a, on a cruise somewhere. And so I told my wife, and she says, well, I hope you have a good time. Uh, I'm not going. <laughs> One time we went out in Mackinac Island. I don't know if you know where that's at, up in the upper Midwest. And I got a rowboat. We were camping there that time. And my wife and I went out in this rowboat, and we went about, I don't know, 45 minutes out into the water. And then we decided to turn around and come back. When we decided to turn around and come back, the wind came up. And it actually blew waves in that water. And so I'm rowing, trying to get back, and all of a sudden, instead of the, the oars hitting the water, they went whoop, and th there was no water there. We had got on top of a wave, and I got a little bit frightened. My, my eyes got a little bit big, and my wife got even more concerned at that time, because uh, she didn't like to get in the boat at, anyway. Well, we found a place that we could kind of stay for a while until maybe the wind went down, and we ended up taking about an hour to get back where we got the boat from. And that was the last boat ride we had. Uh, <laughs> we, we haven't been out on a boat since then. Uh, <clears throat> well, we were out on one other boat, and my wife about drowned, and so now she's really not going to go. I don't have time to tell you that story, but if you ask me later, I can tell you. Anyway, where are we here? It says, but there was a very strong wind that came up, a violent wind. And when the ship was caught in it, we didn't have any other choice. We weren't in control any longer. We were driven by that. So they lost control of the ship, and they go down under Crete, out by another little island, and it says there, running under the shelter of a small little island called Clada, they were scarcely able to get the ship boat under control. After they had hoisted it up, they used supporting cables and undergirding the ship, and fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of Sirtis, they let down the sea anchor, and in this way let themselves be driven along. They actually wrapped the boat in cables. The boat wasn't that strong. It was a wooden boat, and it it was wrapped in cables now, so if they hit some rocks, they may be able to make it through a little bit further. Verse 18 says, The next day, as we were being violently storm-tossed, they began jettisoning the cargo, and on the third day, they threw the ship's tack overboard with their own hands. Here are the sailors, who know how to take care of this ship, decided, let's get rid of the tackle. We don't need it any longer. We're just subject to this wind. I'm thinking, what are they thinking? Any control at all now, they've thrown overboard. They didn't have much control anyway. I don't know if the sail was messed up and, and ripped. I don't know what happened to that, but they were being driven by the wind, and so they were at the subject of wherever this wind would take them. So they threw this stuff overboard. Verse number 20, since neither the sun nor the stars appeared for many days and no small storm was assailing us, from then on... Listen to this. All hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. You ever come to a place like that? All hope of us even being saved was gradually abandoned. The whole, all 275 people, maybe 274, I don't know where Luke and the other guy were, but they didn't have any hope left. The sailors certainly didn't. And they've been ravaged in this storm, tossed about where they didn't know. It was blackout, no matter if it was day or night. They couldn't see the stars at night because there were so many clouds. They couldn't see the sun at daytime because there were so many clouds. They didn't know where they were going or what direction they were going. They just knew they were in big trouble. And finally, they lost all hope. You ever been in that place where you lost your hope? You didn't know what you were doing, where you were going, Maybe it was sickness. Maybe it was a marriage problem. There's all kinds of things that bring us to the place of just having no hope, just not knowing what to do in our situation. I'll never forget my mother when I was a teenager turning to my father and say, I don't have any hope anymore. I listened to my mother say that, and I said, what's going on? 
I'm a teenager. There's always hope, right? Teenagers have hope for anything. Uh, but my mother didn't, and she was going through a real difficult time in her life. And I listened to that, and I said, wow. I wasn't even a Christian at that time, so I didn't even know how to pray for her. But it was a difficult time, I know, for my family. My father was a godly man. He w- I'd often find him reading his Bible, my mother, not very much. But <clears throat> that's what she came to. And if you can imagine yourself on a ship the size of the floor here, actually less than that, uh, because uh, the one part went together almost in an arrow. The back part was not so much narrow like that. But it was only about 40 feet deep, the whole ship. And the bottom was filled with grain, probably 60 tons of grain, or even more than that. I forget the exact number that I read. But they would fill these ships with grain, coming from Egypt, going to Italy. That's how they were supplying their help there. And so there's no place to go, no place to rest. There weren't any beds. There weren't even any cots. Uh, How do you deal with that? How do you put up with that when there's no hope? You think you're going to drown. You're out in the middle of the ocean, and now you've lost all hope. Except for one guy on ship. That's the Apostle Paul. It says in verse 21, when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have listened to me. (laughs) You ought to have followed my advice and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and this loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Hmm, good news, bad news. Okay, the ship's not gonna make it, but we will. How are we gonna make it if we don't have a ship with us? Uh, I think of a lot of things here. He goes on and says in verse 23, for this very night an angel of of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me saying, do not be afraid, Paul, You must stand before Caesar and before God has granted you all of those who are sailing with you. Therefore, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that it will turn out exactly as I have been told. Here's somebody with faith. You can go through any difficulty, any problem, any any problem in your life to where you can still have faith. God gives hope when there is no hope. And so Paul, a prisoner, in chains, stands up. The captain's not saying anything. The pilot's not saying anything. Julius is probably scared out of his mind. But Paul stands up and says, it's going to be okay. God is still with us. In fact, if you go back to chapter 23, God had already spoken to Paul, and he says, you testified of me in Jerusalem, and now you're going to testify of me in Rome. So Paul says, God says, I'm going to go to Rome. So no problem here. And he could have just told them that, but he didn't. He said, an angel of God came to me. And this is what he said. He says, we're all going to make it. I want to encourage you with those words. Hallelujah. You know, there's so many ways in which we can come to know God. And I don't know about you, but here we have 66 books that have what I'm told is about 33 books thousand promises 33,000 promises in it let me just ask you how many have you taken advantage of have you read it on a regular basis do you take time with God and let him speak to you out of his word I don't know how many of you seen an angel I've never seen an angel but I know some people have been brought into a place where angels have appeared to them and give them a message Uh, I haven't seen one yet but I've got the word of God and I know what he's saying to me as I open the word and I begin to read it. Something always begins to come alive to me. In fact, that's how I pray. I don't know how you read the Bible, but before I often do my devotions or read the scripture, say, God in heaven, (laughs) I know that you have ability to speak to me and I know this is your word, so will you just reveal what you want me to know through it? And I've found many, many times that God will just kind of highlight, sometimes just two or three words, sometimes a whole verse, and it'll answer the things that I'm looking for in life. It'll give me a peace that nothing else can give me peace about. 
God's word can do that. It's a light unto our path. It's help to our, our spirits, to our hearts, to our very souls. God has given us something here, and we ought to take advantage of it. I don't know. I, I went to a church one time called the Open Bible. I said, oh, that sounds like a good name for a church. <laughs> Open your Bible. Let's read this. Let's find out what God's saying today. He wants to say something to us. I trust that you don't just come on Sundays and say, Pastor Dan, whoever's speaking, say something good so I can be encouraged. Hope you don't do that. I hope you come here already encouraged. I hope you already come filled with a special word that God has given to you so that when you leave your seat and you walk out into the lobby, that God will connect you with somebody that needs what you just heard from God. That's, I think, one of the greatest things of the fellowship of, of believers. We're called Grace Point Gospel Fellowship. And if you're not getting fellowship here, you're missing something very important. You're missing what God is saying in different people's lives. And I love it when, God, when people come up to me and say, you know what God said to me today? I said, no, tell me. <laughs> I want to know what God said to you. I want to see how that matches with my life. I want to see what God's doing. He speaks to his church. Read the book of Revelation. He's not silent when it comes to the church. He wants to say something very important to us as to how to live our lives, how we're to have fellowship, how we're to go forward, how we're to accomplish his purpose. And we do that as the body of Christ. You know, we're members one of another. I don't know about you, but when we have dinner at home, I say to my wife, how many members are gonna be at this table tonight? <laughs> and she's already counted. And sometimes she's make, she makes food for everybody, whether they're coming or not. And we have that left over for them to come. When they do come, they can eat. Uh, and sometimes our table is full. We have 12 people right now living in our house. And so we have to put out a couple extra chairs around the table so everybody can fit. But sometimes there's only three or four of us because they're scattered doing all kinds of things. And our house is sometimes a little chaotic I don't know if you set down meals with 12 different people, four of them being our grandchildren. And I used to talk at the table, but I don't do a lot of talking anymore. Uh, I do a lot of listening, and uh, it's just an exciting time. But <laughs> fellowship happens, and that's what I want to encourage you today. Paul was encouraging them. He was giving this prophetic warning to them. He says, don't be afraid, down in verse 24. He says, God is with us, but, verse 26, we must run aground on a certain island. Here's the good news, but we must run aground on a certain island. He didn't even know what the island was. And I'd say, Paul, didn't God give you the name of the island? Can't, is it a big island? Is it a safe island? Is it a little patch of dirt in the middle of the ocean. What, what kind of an island is this? I want to know what kind of island I'm going to. Well, he didn't tell them that. Verse 27, but when the 14th night came, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. They took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms, and a little further on they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. So I looked that up and says, how, how deep is this? It started out with 20, which is now 120 feet down. Not a swimming pool. And then they took another one a little bit later, and it was 15 fathoms, only 90 feet. I don't know about you, but I don't swim in 90 feet water. Uh, so at least it was gradually getting less. So maybe we're headed toward land. In the middle of that, it says in verse 29, the first word in my Bible anyway is fearing that we might run aground somewhere on the rocks. They cast four anchors from the stern and wished for daybreak. Let me see. We haven't seen the sun for 14 days. Is the sun going to come out tomorrow? They hope so. They wished it would happen. Verse 30, but as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship and had let down the ship's boat, they had one little boat, into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, 
Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain on the ship, you yourselves will lose your life and cannot be saved. Wow. Now, the decision has to be made. Are, is he telling the truth or what? They all but ready to believe Paul. I mean, they'd gone through hell on earth type of thing on this boat. And so this, the soldiers went over and cut the ropes and dropped the boat into the water. So the guys that wanted to escape with that little boat couldn't do it. And I'm thinking about these guys. I'm not a sailor anyway, but maybe if you were a sailor, you could handle that. But you're going to get in a smaller boat, and you don't know where you are, and you don't know which direction to go, but they were going to escape. Sometimes we don't use a lot of reasoning in trying to get out of our troubles. They were fearful, and being fearful, they wanted to get out of this boat, into a smaller boat. I've never understood that. But anyway, maybe they did. It says in verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. So either they stay or you lose your life. Oh, I think I'll have them stay, right? Okay, verse 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it fall away. Verse 33, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food. Now listen to this, saying, today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. How many like to fast? Don't you believe in fasting anymore? The Bible calls us to fast from time to time. In fact, they just left the fast back in Jerusalem and uh, the days were ending, winter was coming. They had fasted for 14 days. I think they were so frightened by the storm that nobody thought about eating. I don't know what your stomach says to you, but I think I probably would have wanted to eat before 14 days. But none of them had. Paul didn't seem to be. There were no lights either. You couldn't cook something, so it just had to be whatever you could find, if anything. They had wheat down in the bottom of the boat. Have you ever eaten grains of wheat? I'm from Nebraska and Kansas, and we used to take the, the grain and just dump them in our hands, and we would just eat the grains by themselves. It's good stuff, and if you're hungry, there's a lot of food to eat, but nobody had even thought about that for 14 days. I can imagine them running over to the side of the boat and throwing up over the side. Or maybe throwing up into each other's laps. I don't know what was happening, but it was a mess. It was, a, and seeing all of that, who would want to eat? Nobody would want to eat. Well, Paul says, wait a minute, we have food here. Until the day was about the day, he encouraged them to take some food. Today is the 14th day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. For not a hair of your head of any of you will perish. Wow. Anybody comb your hair this morning? <laughs> you found some hair in your comb and your brush? He said, that's not even going to happen here. <laughs> he says, you're going to be so safe. God's going to keep you. And then he goes on and he says this. Having said this, he took bread. He gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them. And he broke it and began to eat. That remind you of anything? I don't think he said, let's have a communion here, folks. But he said, the body of Jesus was broken. Now, he's praying with them. He's not the one in charge. He's not the one making decisions, right? No, God had flipped all of that. Julius wasn't standing up saying, it's okay, we'll make it. The pilot and the, and the, the captain of the ship weren't standing up saying anything. Paul's the one that said something. Let me tell you, church, we have a voice in the time of trouble, in the time of suffering, in the time of stuff going on around us that nobody understands. You have a voice to the people that you meet. You really do. You have the abilities. That's what Paul did. He spoke the word of God, and they listened to him. They had already seen, okay, he knows what's going on here, so now we can eat. And so he broke this bread and began to eat it. Verse 36, and all of them 
were encouraged, and they themselves took some food because now there's work for us to do. Okay, listen to this. It says in verse 37, and all of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now we have some focus here. God is with us. We can eat again. God's going to prepare us now for something. And they start emptying out tons of wheat into, into the ocean. They thought, at least we can do that. We can make the ship lighter, and maybe we can get further up on the beach so we don't have to swim. I don't know. That's what I would have thought. But anyway, they were there dumping the wheat out into the sea. God was doing something special here. He gave them hope where there was no hope. He gave them food that they hadn't eaten for 14 days. And he says, God's going to take care of us. And so he prayed in their midst to God, thanking him for the bread that we have to eat. And as they ate, they were stronger, and they went and started dumping the wheat out into the ocean. I can't go on beyond this. Next week, you're going to have to come back and find out the end of the story. <laughs> this is as far as Pastor Daniel gave me to go. <laughs> so we're going to stop there. So now come back next week, okay? But let me just tell you one other thing before I leave this. The thing that came to me is that they were going to lighten the boat. And I began to think about our lives, how cluttered they must be. We have an attic at home this summertime. I'm going to go up, and most of it is going out to the curb because we don't use any of that stuff anymore. And even the rest of our house, it's cluttered with stuff that we don't use, that we don't need. And I thought about them lightening the boat. I think we need to lighten our lives. We're too busy. We're too involved in too many things. We need to cut some things out and we need to throw them overboard so that God can speak to us, so that we can be safe in our shipwreck because that's gonna happen. Shipwreck is coming to this nation, to this world, to our communities. Shipwreck, if you haven't seen the news and found out what's going on with young people's lives these days, then you're stuck in a hole and you don't know what's happening. But this, I don't know, I read about other nations. How long did nations survive? Well, none of them survived for very long. We've survived for quite a while. Will this nation continue? I don't want to scare you today, but <laughs> we are the hope of the world, folks. We are it. There's no hope out there. There's no hope in the Republicans. There's no hope in the Democrats. There's no hope in Washington, D.C. There's no hope in your police department much anymore. Everybody's trying to get rid of anything, of any kind of semblance today. What is left but anarchy? You like living in anarchy? I've seen enough movies about that. I don't, I don't want to go there. We need to lighten our boat. We need to lighten our lives. And I don't know what's there for you, but we need to get rid of a bunch of stuff because we need to concentrate on the things that God's doing in our life. We need to know what he's saying to us. We are the mouthpiece of God to the world, and we need to not be so cluttered in so many things because we don't have time to talk to people. We don't have time to fellowship with people. We don't have time because we're messed up with all of this other stuff. Let me just challenge you this morning. What is it that God would like to lighten your boat with? What is it that you'd like to put aside and say, I don't need to do that anymore. I need to be more focused with what God called me to do. God has called us all to serve him and to serve one another. How are we doing that? Oh, I have so many things I'd like to say to you right now. <laughs> Marriages, jobs, homes, cars, and other stuff that we have to deal with. It's all a bunch of stuff that keeps us upset from time to time. If we just had the peace of God about everything and let all of that stuff go, and just focus down to what God would want us to concentrate on. 
I wonder how our lives would work out. God is speaking to you about putting something on the side. I know many times during revivals that they would bring books, tapes, records, all kinds of stuff. Say, we don't need this stuff anymore. And they'd actually make a bonfire and burn all that stuff up. Do you have a fireplace? Maybe you can start there. (laughs) Get rid of stuff that you don't use, that you don't need, that isn't something that God has blessed you with. I need to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're the God of life and peace and joy. And sometimes even though we've met you, even so we've surrendered our lives to you, even though we've confessed you as our Lord and Savior, we've sometimes just gone the way of the world around us and we've picked up so much stuff that it's hard to even stop to read your word and to say, God, what do you have for me today? Who is it you want me to talk to today? Who is it that I can encourage today? Paul did it, and Lord, you're calling us to do that. Help us, Lord, to know what to put aside, what to get rid of, what to focus on so that you would truly be Lord of Lords in our lives. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your salvation. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a a Holy Spirit that would lead us and guide us into the truth that you have for us. Help us, Lord, to focus on those things and even sometimes those things alone that you might be glorified in and through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Stand and let's worship the Lord and let's see what else God has for us.